So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Girardi, Assistant Curator for the Niagara Falls History Museum, and I want to welcome everyone to this very special virtual program. As we do with all of our program, we will begin with a land acknowledgement to recognize the land in which we share with all peoples. So the Niagara region of Ontario is located on the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Tanati peoples. The Tanatan people have called these lands home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. As the country tomorrow on September 30th, oh, sorry, across the country tomorrow on September 30th, as a nation, we will pause and reflect on the history and legacy of the residential schools. Within the Niagara Falls Museums and the Culture Division of the City of Niagara Falls, we have fostered relationships with the Indigenous community and in the creation of workshops, lectures and exhibitions, we continue to take steps towards healing through education and understanding. Today's presentation is a reflection on Indigenous law, treaties and nationhood in response to the Universal Declaration of Indigenous Rights, Government Policies and Haudenosaunee Tenacity. The Haudenosaunee are attempting to be the first Indigenous nation to be part of the Olympic family. As the game of lacrosse is being considered for the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, the Haudenosaunee are seeking recognition of their nationhood on the international stage in order to play a game that they invented. Win, lose, or draw, it will be a great test about the survivability of Haudenosaunee nationhood. Just one quick word on housekeeping for today. Following the presentation, there will be opportunities for you to ask your questions. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can type your questions into the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can put your question into the Facebook comments and I will be monitoring that. Feel free to add your questions in throughout the presentation, but we won't be stopping to answer the questions until the very end. But as I said, feel free to pop them in at any point and I will get to them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter. Rick Hill is a Tuscarora citizen of the Haudenosaunee, a confederation of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora nations. He has been responsible for recovery of wampum belts from museums and historic societies, uncovering the history they carry, and sharing these teachings so that the lessons of history are not forgotten. He has worked for the National Museum of the American Indian, the State University of New York at Buffalo, Six Nations Polytechnic, and is now the Indigenous Innovation Specialist at Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario. Good afternoon, Rick. Well, hello, thank you for uh, having me today. I'm going Thanks. to be uh, showing a PowerPoint to uh, help uh, tell this story that I wanted to, uh, to bring out to people today. So let me get that up and rolling and then we can, um, To see. So the question that I'm raising today, is Indigenous nationhood still possible? Well, a lot of people in our community said, well, of course, because it hasn't gone away. Others would say, no, there never was such a thing. But let's take a look at that, what it means, particularly in light of the truth and reconciliation. On October uh, 1924, <clears throat> the Mounties, along with some uh, government officials, came to our community. They nailed this proclamation on the door where the council chiefs were meeting and declared that they were going to hold public elections, that no longer would the community be governed by our chiefs and our clan mothers, but that these public elections would take place. And so they said they ousted the chiefs that we can see here on the left-hand side. Um, I'm related to two of them directly. The guy that I'm named after, Richard Hill, he's way in the back. And uh, his uh, brother, Josiah Hills, in the, in the front. And they were replaced then by these elected councillors. In the first election in 1924, I, I, I doubt if there was more than two dozen people voting. But for the last 99 years, we've had a struggle in our community as to who governs the Haudenosaunee, who governs the territory of the Six Nations. What Truth and Reconciliation talks about, it goes way beyond just uh, residential schools, but takes a look again at uh, how uh, law is handled, how jurisdiction matters. Uh, take a look at a lot of things. So uh, th that's why I wanted to focus on this today. 
when they came in 1924, they wanted to confiscate all of the wampum that we had. Wampum are tiny beads made out of shell that are woven together in symbolic designs. As you can see here, this large circle, that represents all of our different chiefs. We have 50 chiefs all together in our confederation. Uh, because they knew that the wampum was the symbol of our nationhood. If they could grab the wampum, then that would be a way of diminishing our power. However, all they could find was what we see on the photograph on the left. These strings that are used to open a council fire and a hand full of beads. Fortunately, our men were able to, uh, to secret away these other wampum belts, but eventually uh, they kind of disappeared. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. This was one of the belts that the chiefs held in 1924. It talks about how our, our, our leaders are supposed to put their arms together to form this circle to protect the culture, uh, the people, uh, the law with inside that circle. So this is instruction to our chiefs. Th this is our law. Oh, I'm afraid you can't see this one here. I'll have to go on. Uh, what this was showed was that, that you know, there's been very, very agent, various agencies in dealing with us from the old Indian department back in the colonial era up till today. But we'll, that'll make sense as we go through this. Oh, sorry, here we go. So the Indian department from 1755 to 1880. From 1880 to 1996, it was just called Indian Affairs. The Indian was the common term applied to us. 96, uh, and I mean, 1966 to uh, 2017, it was the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs. Uh, sometimes it's called the uh, Indian and Northern Development. And now we have it uh, broken into two, a Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs and Indigenous Services Canada. Through all, all of this, they've had to wrestle with what do we do with the Haudenosaunee? How, how do we engage with them? Like I said, up until uh, 1922, they were dealing with our chiefs and our clan mothers. Since then, things have changed. In 1922, uh, just two years before they uh, uh, nailed that uh, proclamation up, one of our chiefs, you can see him here in the middle, his name was uh, Levi General, he carried the title of Tuscahe, went to uh, Geneva to try to get the Haudenosaunee uh, entered into the newly formed League of Nations. He carried our own passport at the time. This is our version of our passport today but, uh, that I've uh, used to travel overseas. So notice he's holding this silver belt, and next to him, somebody holds the two-row wampum, and then the other is the covenant chain wampum. And you can see them here. These are the actual belts that uh, Descahe held when he went out over there. Well, he wasn't able to uh, get uh, uh, the Haudenosaunee into the League of Nations, and he wasn't able to present his case at the time, because he was arguing on behalf of our people that Canada had invaded our territory. We're sending their police there. We're trying to uh, undermine our inherent sovereignty. And he argued that we had a long history of being allies. We're not, we're not subjects to the crown, we're allies to the crown. And so you can see where these wampum belts are important because they, they're, they're historic. They explain the nature of that. These are original treaty belts. Now these two, two in particular were replicas, even though they're made with real wampum beads of the uh, original belts that I'll show you. In 1959, a group of uh, uh, traditional people went and reoccupied that council house that they had been uh, locked out of uh, since 1924. And as you can see by this newspaper article, I said, you know, we're gonna uh, open an independent nation. Well, in our mind, we were always independent. We, we've never been defeated in war. We've never been conquered. We never uh, relinquished our, uh, our sovereignty to anybody else. Uh, it's just that the Canadian government moved in and uh, claimed authority. So in many ways, our nationhood has never been uh, never been uh, absolved. We still uh, we believe we are the Haudenosaunee, the uh, people, the United Confederacy of the nations that was explained in the beginning. In 1977, our chiefs went back to Geneva, and this is a photograph taken then where they were meeting with the mayor of uh, Geneva. When Descartes went over there in 1924, he met a young boy, a little boy, and he, he was kind of, he was kind to him. He, he's paid attention to this little boy. <clears throat> Wouldn't you know, that little boy grew up to be the mayor. He's the guy in the gray suit. Uh, and so when our chiefs arrived, he asked, where is Descartes? Well, the man he knew as Descartes had passed away, 
And on our system, the title passes on to somebody else. So there was a man living at that time made a name to Skahe, but he uh, didn't make the trip. But for some reason, he had written this letter to be given if anybody asks, where, where's Tuskahe? And so our chiefs also brought a, a Gestoa or headdress to bestow upon them. So what the mayor of Geneva said, as long as he's alive, the Haudenosaunee will always be welcome. And so our passport has been accepted in, in uh, uh, Geneva uh, because that's also where uh, an office of the United Nations uh, rests. And we have been uh, actively involved in representing our people overseas. Then the United Nations uh, got uh, more involved in that um, because, you know, there's indigenous people all around the world, but they decided to look at what were the rights of indigenous people? What were the inherent rights? What were their treaty rights? What were their land rights? And after about 20, 25 years of discussion, you can imagine how difficult it is to get all of the indigenous people in one mind, much less all of the, the other countries of the world to come to one mind. But as we know, then they did develop the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You know, they adopted that in 2007. Uh, Canada and the United States and Great Britain were not too hot on this idea. They refused to uh, uh, approve that declaration. But our people worked on them, not only overseas, but here uh, at home. And so finally, uh, we can see in 2016, the government of Canada finally decided to endorse the declaration without qualification and committed to its most full and effective implementation. And in 2021, they passed this act that was then got royal assent in order to do that. So there is a, an official implementation policy now on UNDRIP that I, I recommend you check out because it's very interesting, very, very interesting to me. The implementation plan they're talking about is from 23 to, I mean, 2023 to 2028. So they're giving themselves five years to begin to develop this. And knowing the way things go in Ottawa, that's very optimistic, but let's just say that at least they're, uh, they're at least they ran out of the starting gate on a, on a good note. So they want a better, more equitable future between us. And it says together with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, and we are moving forward and honoring nation to nation, Inuit to crown, and government to government relations based upon the affirmation of rights, the values of mutual respect and working together as equal parties. Now in the international arena and in the government arena, words are very powerful. And sometimes they mean th different things than you may think they mean. So let's take a look at that. So they said nation to nation, Inuit to crown and government to government. They're kind of covering all of their bases. If it's just government to government, you know, they're, the federal government has a government to government relationship with the provinces. The provinces aren't nations. A nation to nation would, would recognize the nationhood of the of both parties. So this would seem to imply that yes, there is a future for indigenous nationhood in Canada. And it's a matter of kind of working out the, all of the, uh, the details of what that can mean. So the Inuit live a little bit differently and don't have the same kind of governmental structure that a lot of uh, uh, you know, other indigenous nations have. So that's why they say Inuit to our crown. And I'm assuming the government to government would cover the Métis people. So they have uh, they have uh, regional governments as well. So it's significant, very significant to me that the nation to nation part is part of this uh, this new implementation plan. The plan has uh, 181 specific measures that they want to address. And there's, a, there's a whole lot in there. Because it's also about, as you see, uh, you know, addressing injustices, prejudice, violence, racism, all this all the, the stuff that interferes with healthy relationships. But in particular, they said they want to advance self-determination and self-government. They want to advance an honorable implementation of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. That, those, for, those are kind of like international uh, uh, words uh, representing all kinds of agreements between uh, nations. They want to ensure meaningful participation by us in these discussions that take place and in the decision making. And they want to revitalize, help to revitalize our languages, cultures, and legal systems. So again, their words are very important because if 
Now, you also, when you read this, you, you realize sometimes they, they don't quite say what you think they say, or they say something that could be interpreted in a different way. But when they say self-determination, that's been a common phrase since the 1970s. What does that mean to, for a group of people, a nation of people, to determine their own destiny, their own sense of self, uh, their own nationhood, and then to have self-government? Again, that's kind of a loaded term, though, because they're uh, self-government uh, now are these what they're calling new treaties agreements they make with the uh, elective councils about how they're going to uh, manage uh, the uh, the government services and then they talk though about resurrecting legal systems well that's to the heart of the matter what we're talking about today we have an, the oldest legal system in, in north america that's still functioning it predates the formation of canada and the united states and it operates in a very different principles than uh, British rule of law. And it talks about treaties. So treaties are very, a wide variety of them. And as you can see, there are many reasons why treaties were made. <clears throat> Canada has been arguing that they're not responsible for treaties that were made before Confederation. At the same time, they're saying indigenous rights started with the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which was before Confederation. So I think we gotta, we gotta kind of really work at that. What are, is Canada honor bound by the treaties that were made uh, with Great Britain on behalf of this land, this territory and the people? Now we believe so, but we need to take a look at all of that. So maybe England needs to be part of this reconciliation discussion as well. Like I mentioned, we have our own law, a very ancient law, and that's what this uh, painting I did represents. So here's our peacemaker and a, one of the original chiefs, Hiawenta. They're holding this wampum belt that it codifies the uh, belief. It represents the original five nations <clears throat> on the Tuscarora. We joined the Confederation in about 1720. <clears throat> and then we have an eagle landing on top to protect, to look out for our interests. Excuse me. So you could say that belt is our law. It has a, how we formed our confederation, what the rules are, uh, what the operating protocols are all about. And we have dozens of these belts. So you hear the term a lot, indigenous sovereignty. What does that really mean? Uh, how, how can we take a look at that? Well, within this document they're talking about, they consulted with a variety of indigenous people. They didn't consult with our chiefs and clan mothers. But they, the people they did consult with made these points. That <clears throat> there's an inherent right to self-determination, self-government that goes across all aspects of uh, intergovernmental services. And they want, to, wait, they want a transition plan to replace the old Indian Act. So that uh, came about when, when Canada was uh, confederated to a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship. So that's very significant there. Going to be very difficult to do, but very important. Because right now, under the Indian Act, we're subjects to the crown. We're almost like wards of the government. They, they get to determine what's best for us uh, on, on just about every aspect of our lives. <clears throat> Upholding and implementing all historic and modern treaty rights. Well, that's what the indigenous people want. But we got to understand what are those treaties? What are the obligations? Uh, what are our obligations to the treaty? And incorporating indigenous uh, traditional customary laws and processes. So. Like I mentioned, now we just have one. Now imagine if there's uh, several hundred indigenous nations across Canada, one size isn't going to fit all. We've got to really negotiate what this means on a almost on a community-to-community -community basis. So <clears throat> it's an uphill battle, that's for sure. But at least I think we're 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 beginning to to go forward on that path. It also talks about modern treaties. The Supreme Court of Canada said. Modern treaties are the pinnacle of reconciliation between indigenous people and the crown and are the primary tool for the reconciliation of prior and unextinguished Aboriginal rights and asserted Canadian sovereignty. <clears throat> I'm not sure all of our people would agree with uh, that, but it because uh, it depends on which term the modern treaty. Our treaty relationship with the crown goes back to 1667, and we had a uh, you know, hundred treaty uh, engagements. And you got to remember the treaty isn't just that piece of parchment. It's really the relationship. It's it's the treaty minutes. It's the wampum belt. It's all of those things that we agreed to 
along the way of making peace and friendship between our people. <clears throat> and the old process that the, the Crown uh, initiated through the Indian Department <clears throat> was very formal, <clears throat> very highly documented. As you can see in this little logo and uh, attached to the top of a, of a colonial document, we see the tree of peace, the council tree, the heart in the middle, the chain that connects both sides together. We see the British officials handing a peace medal, a piece of silver to the uh, native leaders. We see the council fire. We can see a pipe laying on the ground because they'll smoke a pipe once they make agreement. And at the bottom, we can actually see grass growing because one of our treaty stipulations is that the treaty will be valid as long as the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, as long as water flows downhill, as long as grass turns green at a certain time of year. Well, climate change may change that, but that was the that was the hope. So it's fair to ask: Do do those old treaties do they last forever? Like the Haldeman Agreement that we see here, the Haldeman Proclamation, which has in it that the land was given to them and their posterity to enjoy forever. Well, we all realize now there's a big fight over, over a lot of that land. What happened to it? <clears throat> so if there was an agreement in the beginning, we'll say between uh, Joseph Brandt, we see here and King George uh, the third, um, how is it still valid today? What happens when the treaty's broken? What happens when the crown or Canada has just ignored the treaty for 100, 200, 300 years? our treaty making was always accompanied with wampum belts to document our side of the story. Since we couldn't always read those uh, marks on paper, we put it together in a wampum belt. Now you can see the two row, and you can see it's a little tattered and torn, much like our relationship, but it's there. Uh, two long paths, one representing the, the ship of the colonizer, the other the canoe of the indigenous people. They're floating down the river of life side by side. And it says that the people of the ship, they won't pass laws to try to impose their law on the people of the canoe. And the people of the canoe won't try to impose their law on the people of the ship. And we try to maintain that. But now as we're facing this ecological holocaust, I don't think we can just sit back and let the ship continue to do what it's been doing to the land, uh, destroying the, the earth. And maybe a, Maybe some of our practical uh, laws from the canoe need to apply to the Canadian state. Underneath, we can see the covenant chain. When the, when the British defeated the Dutch, they made this one belt. And they took that two row and they, they made it into this covenant chain that connects the crown on one side with the Haudenosaunee on the other side. And that chain represents this connection between our people, an open path of communication, of honest communication. Whenever we need some attention, uh, that chain would help uh, attach us together. In the two row, they said there was a chain also tied between the ship and the canoe. And it had these three links. First link represented friendship. Second link uh, represented the good minds, and it's gonna be fair to each other. The third link is that we'll always have peace. So that's the founding values of our treaty relationship, and I believe can be the founding values for our new relationship to today. When the Covenant chain came, and they kind of uh, revised that a bit. The Covenant chain has three links, but now they say the first link represents respect. We have to have mutual respect. Second, we have to build trust. And if we do that, then we can have ongoing peace and friendship. Now, it doesn't take a genius to realize that those first two are going to be very difficult to have respect and build trust, given our history and everything that, that has happened. But our leaders laid out this plan. And they said, you know, that even helped us uh, get past our war and murder and uh, all kinds of strife between our people. So maybe those principles can work again if we apply them uh, fairly. And there's a whole process by which uh, that was established and how matters get resolved. I won't run through all of these here, but let's just say that the, the, the protocol are there for making peace between indigenous nations and, and the government. It's been time tested and true, and I think we need to, to, uh, to resurrect some of those practices again. In 1764, there's a treaty at Niagara where the covenant chain was extended to the Anishinaabeg people. So these are 
Now we don't have these belts anymore, but these are two uh, belts uh, that uh, there were some drawings made of them. So we can see the, the same idea though, the colonial leader, the indigenous leader, those octagons represent the dish from which we all can eat. And they put their name or their dates on there uh, in their fashion. But there's complex problems, big matters, if we're going to reconcile on this. One is about land. I mean, maybe it's always been about land, always will it be about land. But right now we have two very different ideas about it. So under British law, European law, the doctrine of discovery, we just have the right of occupation where the crown owns the title all the way down to the center of the earth. Well, we got to do some rethinking about that if we're going to reconcile all these matters. Think of it this way. Indigenous relations, crown relations are like a huge iceberg. There's some things we see on top now with truth and reconciliation. I mean, we can see the orange shirt thing going on. We can see the the, what's going on with the, the murdered and missing women. We, we understand that, but underneath that, what, what drove all of that? What are, the, what are the fundamental ideas that have to change in order to have this productive future? That's what's gonna be hard to get to, but also uh, absolutely necessary. Now you can ask, you know, what does lacrosse have to do with all of this? This is one of our, our, our players, <clears throat> Jeremy Thompson, as they're playing against uh, Team Canada. <clears throat> Well, what we believe is lacrosse is very important to our identity, our, our nationality, our culture. It's a game that we invented a long time ago, but we also uh, play lacrosse for many different reasons. We have a, a medicine or a spiritual game that we still play in our ceremonies for the health of individuals. We also have what I call the fun game that is played to you know, to thrill the the, uh, the, the crowds, uh, have some healthy competition between our uh, communities. But it's also the game that's played for political recognition on the international stage. We had a team tour England in 1876. Uh, apparently they ha held a game uh, at the Crystal Palace and Queen Victoria was there. She loved the game. I think she may have loved seeing these guys run around in tight pants. But anyway, she loved the game. And um, she declared it that uh, it was uh, uh, going to be uh, an official sport. And it spread across the British uh, uh, Dominion. We played in uh, Ireland, and, uh, Wales, and Scotland, uh, and all the way from New Zealand and into Canada. It technically is still Canada's official summer sport. In 1914, we had a team of players from six nations. They were in St. Louis and they got invited to participate in the Olympic games that were being held. The lacrosse was an Olympic sport at one time, but what happened in, in uh, excuse me, I think that's actually supposed to be 1904. Um, the, um, there were only gonna be four teams there and two of them didn't show up. So they drafted this Iroquois team that was there performing at the World's Fair. Could you come over and participate in this? So they did. And they ended up actually winning the bronze medal. But in order to participate, they couldn't wear their Iroquois jersey. They had to wear a Canada jersey. So in the record books, it shows that Canada won the, the, the bronze, the uh, silver, and Americans won the, the gold medal. But in reality, it was the all Haudenosaunee team that won their bronze medal. So maybe we should try to get that medal back. 1983, we formed the Iroquois Nationals. Now, the Iroquois is an old word that was applied to our, our people, but it was a, a, it's a kind of, we've decided it was a common term. People would understand who we were. And our team got launched. Uh, we got beat severely in uh, games. Prior to that, our teams that played in international games, of course, they hardly ever, ever lost. So we had an uphill battle to not only get recognized, as a nation to have our teams play in international competition, but also to be competitive. And, uh, and the Iroquois Nationals then uh, launched a major campaign. At first, the International Lacrosse Federation wouldn't accept our application. They kept working at it, working at it, uh, and, and eventually they did. They accepted the Haudenosaunee as a member nation to the International Lacrosse Federation. But you gotta remember at the time, there was only uh, Canada, United States, England, and Australia. We became the fifth nation. Today, 
there's over 80 nations playing lacrosse uh, from all around the world. I believe we've been critical to help with that expansion because we bring something to the game that's just uncomparable because it not only is it from our, our history and our culture, but our players just play so this distinctive form of lacrosse. So get this, today, our men's team, now called the Haudenosaunee Nationals, are ranked third in the whole world out of those 80 some nations. Our women's team, I, I don't know the exact, I think they're about 13th, uh, 14th place. Our box lacrosse team, indoor lacrosse, is ranked second in the world. So you have to ask, how could you possibly leave the, one of the top lacrosse playing nations out of the Olympics? Well, like I mentioned at the time, we applied for admission. Uh, we weren't, we were denied, uh, but we decided to tour England. And England invited us over for a tour. We went over there and it was really great. Uh, and you wouldn't believe how meticulous the lacrosse uh, pitch, as they call it over there in England. But it was really great. Well, we traveled on our own passport. And I think that's very significant because that was the question. If you're a member nation, how are you going to travel around the world? Said, well, we have this passport we've been using for a long time. And we were lucky with the support of uh, some members of uh, parliament over in uh, London. We got our whole team over there to play. This is what our passport looks like. This is one of our chiefs, Warren Lyons, as he's uh, entering into West Germany, the passport. Things are going pretty good until the, after September 11th and uh, the Homeland Security was formed and the World Travel Initiative was launched. Our passport got labeled a fantasy document because we weren't considered a real nation by Homeland Security. So we have been trying to work ever since then uh, with them, with the State Department in the U.S., uh, with other uh, uh, embassies from around the world, to get them to understand the nature of this uh, matter, that we are the Haudenosaunee, we are independent nations. <clears throat> well, across, though, isn't, it's, something else happens, because we start building these relationships. In this case, this is uh, uh, Orrin, who is the, the, the chairperson of our uh, Haudenosaunee Nationals, with the head coach from the New Zealand team. They're providing this uh, hand-carved gift to our team. And across it just generates this connection between people. Uh, and then here's the other thing that happened that I, I just never thought would take place. They asked us one time, uh, do you have a flag? And uh, Oren said, do we have a flag? And Tim Johnson and I created a flag. And that's what it looks like. That's what you see flying around. It's based upon that wampum belt. Then they asked, do you have an anthem? And Warren created one, and we sing that today. But one time our team was taking a field, and uh, you see, when I saw our flag rising up, and all the nations of the world that were playing all stood and honored our, our nationhood, our flag, and our team. That kind of changed my mind because I, I used to be kind of one of the protests. I would always sit when the Canadian or American anthem are played. But now when I saw they're respecting us, well, remember that treaty thing? You have to have common mutual respect. So if we want respect, we have to give it. So now when all of the teams are out there, I stand for everybody's flag and anthem because this is about a different kind of uh, nationhood of recognizing the validity of everybody standing before this. So Orrin, uh, he was uh, one of the founders, him and I, one of the founders of the Haudenosaunee Nationals. So when you're talking about lacrosse, you're talking about the lifeblood of the Six Nations. The game is engraved into our culture and our lives. This is our game and it's our gift to the world. But in the international arena, the United Nations does not recognize the Haudenosaunee as a nation. Our treaties aren't recognized in their international treaty database. It's all considered domestic agreements. So there's gotta be a big shift in the world and the UN has tried to do that uh, with its uh, uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. But the question of indigenous nationhood has really not been answered. <clears throat> but when you see our team take the field and you see how people uh, honor us, uh, and uh, like we said in the intro, you know, win, lose, or draw, we're there uh, competing. Uh, we had a great tournament in San Diego, international tournament uh, 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 earlier this uh, uh, year. 
and our teams are very competitive. We've always uh, uh, had a tough time with the United States and Canada, but I don't know. I can't, what can I tell you? We're we're there, right there in the middle, right there in the finals. We're 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 right there with the top uh, countries of the world. And to me, that's that's an amazing story. So not everybody could be in this position that we're in. Not everybody is ready to to demonstrate their nationhood like the Haudenosaunee have. And we continue to stand by our treaties. This is a treaty gathering we have over in New York uh, every uh, November 11th. Our Canandaigua Treaty we made with the United States is, uh, is uh, resurrected or recalled. Uh, this year, we expect some high profile participation from the White House on this matter because our treaties are gaining, um, how do you want to say it? People are rethinking these, what, rethinking the fact that they didn't know about them that these treaties do matter and how could they apply to the future? And uh, many of these wampum belts are still, they fuel our consciousness, our sense of ourselves. And as we can see here, two of our leaders, Sid Hill, who's an Onondaga, he holds this one wampum belt that talks about his, his particular uh, titles or responsibilities. And the other one is Jock Hill. He's uh, kind of a leading uh, interpreter of this great law of peace, that original law that we talked about. And he's holding that uh, original Wampum Belt. And then Oren's holding this belt we call the dish. You heard about it in the land acknowledgement. The dish with one spoon. Well, this is the belt that talks about that. The purple figure is the dish, and inside the dish is a beaver tail. But when you ask our people, what is it that we're really looking for then? <clears throat> okay, so we know that our rights are affirmed in the Canadian Constitution, but we're saying our rights are inherent rights. And, and it's nice to have the recognition, but it's, they're not being granted to us by Canada or the United States or even the United Nations. But that our relationships are continuous and they're always forming and reforming. You know, the, we, like any treaty relationship, it keeps going on and on and on. And sometimes one treaty falls out of fashion or is outdated, and then you got to make a new one. But our relationship to nature also matters. And now, given what I mentioned earlier about the ecological holocaust, we have to think more about that. Law and morality are found in our daily actions, not just in uh, courthouses and our parliament houses. We got to think about how we are all treaty partners. We can all make a treaty real. We can all make the dish real. So we seek reciprocity between each other as we seek that with the earth and by the other indigenous nations. We need to seek that with each other. So in the old days, the chain was the metaphor used to represent our treaty relationship. And at one point, uh, they said, preserve my words in your heart to look upon this belt, this wampum belt, as the chain which binds you to the English and never let it slip out of your hands. Well, that chain has grown pretty rusty. Uh, we used to gather regularly to, what we say, polish the chain to uh, knock all the dust off, which is, you know, all of the things that interfere in a healthy relationship, uh, remake it new, uh, strengthen it again, and find ways in which our, our people can be good allies together. So those are the ideas that I wanted to share with you today and have some discussion around what, what does all this mean and where can we move forward on this? So I wanted to uh, make sure we had some time to to uh, respond to any questions you may have or any uh, additional uh, comments. So uh, please uh, send in whatever whatever question you may have. Thank well, you so we, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, Rick, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Yeah. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. Um, and like Rick just mentioned, now is your chance. Any of our participants who are here, if you would like to type in your questions in the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on Zoom, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, I am monitoring any comments that you would type just below your video there. You can just type them right in there and I'd be happy to read them out. Um, while we wait for some of our participants to perhaps work, formulate those questions and type them out, I do have a question, if I may begin. Um, do you still have the wampum belts that you have shown us? Oh, yes. Uh, most of them uh, that we are aware of, we were able to uh, locate them and return them to our community. Uh, they got taken away in the 1880s, 1890s. They were in museums all over the place. So one of my uh, responsibilities was to help recover them. I, I didn't do it by myself, but that was important. And we've only recovered them since uh, 1985. So we've been on a 
on a steep journey ourselves to learn what the story is. But you know, there's something about wampum. They say when the belt was made, those words were spoken into the belt. It, it captures the word. So when you pick that belt up, if you're good, as they say, a good heart, good mind, that belt kind of talks through you. So that's how you're able to maintain the consistency of the oral tradition. So I'm happy to say today we have over 400 different wampum items, uh, belts, uh, strings, uh, beads that we recovered from museums all over the place, and we use them quite actively. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. They ask, the symbol on the flag represents wampum belts. Is there significance to the color purple on the flag and uniforms? Yes, in fact, I, I don't know where I was. I was at a meeting the other day and uh, somebody, a non-native showed up in purple and he said, uh, I, I understand purple is a Haudenosaunee color. So to show respect, he said, I, I bought, I'm wearing this purple shirt. Well, wampum only comes in two colors, white and purple. Generally, when the background is dark, it's talking about uh, dark, uh, uh, tragic uh, war times when, when things are bad. So like that one belt with the shoujo of the, of the tree and the nations, that represents the bright light of peace entering and tying our people together. When a belt was white in the background, it really comes from, well, this was a good thing that took place. But you only have those two colors to work with. So sometimes the belts would have been painted red, particularly during times of war, but generally those two colors are used. And the designs uh, change through time. A lot of geometric designs in the beginning and pretty soon like those ones I showed you, uh, dates are added, uh, uh, names are added. There were some even uh, with Latin words uh, for those that they became a Catholic. So, but the important thing is that wampum was absolutely critical in this relationship. And I still believe that's also true today. So if we're going to, if there are going to be indigenous nations, if our indigenous nation is going to survive, we have to have a treaty wampum relationship with Canada. And I think that's what we're advocating for. Wonderful. We have another question. Um, first, they start off with a comment. Thank you for your incredible insight, Rick, as always. I have a question about the two row wampum. I have seen the purple lines running all through the belt, but also versions where there is a small white section at the beginning, signifying the agreement began and never ends. Um, can you clarify which of these is correct? And thank you. Uh, the tattered belt that I showed, that's the original one where the lines run off the end. The belt that Descahe took to Geneva, that's the one that had the white lines at either end. Uh, I can only assume that the, the fellow who make it, made it, which I believe was Seth Newhouse, <clears throat> he was either making it from memory or he wanted to make it distinctive from the original belt. So whatever reason, he put those white lines uh, at the end, uh, but they weren't intended because it's supposed to run on forever, go on forever. So you wouldn't want to put an end, a beginning and an end to that. Okay. We have a question coming to us from Facebook Live. Is there a plan for a central museum of indigenous people's history or would a museum be more on a per tribe basis we visited the American Indigenous Museum in Washington, DC, and it was a great place to see the important artifacts and the explanation of the common historical events from the indigenous perspective. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know, there is not a plan right now for a, a national indigenous uh, museum here in uh, Canada. Uh, but I think now the way things are going, cause I, you know, I used to work at that museum in, in Washington how difficult it is to collapse everybody's story down to a, a label of 150 words at a sixth grade level of comprehension. I think you got to go to your local source. Now, there's certainly a lot of uh, community museums like the Woodland Cultural Center. There's a lot of uh, Indigenous Studies programs at universities and colleges all across Canada. So I think there's where you're going to find the best avenue to find what that local story is. What what because it's, it's different. Um, how they look at things in BC is different than how we look at things here in what do you know country. So you have to learn to appreciate uh, kind of like all of those different worldviews. Wonderful. Another question, um, in what, sorry, in what way are indigenous nations already sovereign? Well, like I mentioned, uh, you know, we, for the Haudenosaunee, we never 
we never defeated in war. We never capitulated. Uh, so we've never been conquered. So we retain that sovereignty, whatever we have. Now you can give away sovereignty. And that's what we believe happens with the elected uh, governments. They're not, they're not nations. They're a construct of Canada by which they, they, they manage to control people under the Indian Act. Nationhood it's got to come from somewhere. And we believe it's those are the traditional sources of, of uh, sovereignty and law in Native communities. So the, the passport thing is an important manifestation of that. Uh, if you're a nation, you, you have the authority to make passports. But the nation, other nations also have can have the right to say, we don't recognize that passport. So when you enter in the international arena, the rules are a little different. It's, a, it's more, it's not just about what you say to be true. You have to negotiate the uh, recognition of your sovereignty at all levels. And so that's what we're trying to do on this matter of um, a lacrosse. But let me say this too. Uh, a lot of people get confused because they talk about indigenous law in Canada, when in reality, it's law applied to indigenous people. There is indigenous law, like our great law of peace, you know, about uh, Anishinaabeg law, uh, uh, Huron Wendat law, uh, Haida law. That's their inherent law that came before there was ever Canada. So reconciling those two things, I think that's going to be the challenge behind this uh, implementation plan. All right, and I think we just have one more question. If anybody else has a question, you still have time to. Um... Sorry, we just yeah, okay, we're good there. Um... <laughs> You still have time, people, if anybody else wants to submit a question, but um, what is the federal government doing to recognize your nationhood? Well, uh, sometimes I'm mystified by that. I just uh, found out about this implementation plan uh, last week. I just started going through it uh, in preparation for this uh, presentation. And so I'm still trying to figure out what's real, uh, what's honest, and what's possible. I have to say, however, I'm quite hopeful because it seemed to me that certainly the right things were said, the stage was set uh, properly. I do believe there are many people in the federal government who earnestly want a healthy relationship with indigenous people that uh, recognizes our, our inherent and treaty rights. But we all carry so much baggage from the colonial past, from the Indian Act. It's just so, it's so over overbearing on all of us that that's what's hard to to get out of so when they say they want to make a have a process to go from the indian act to nation to nation um you we couldn't ask for more but what we're saying is that process was already in place that's what i tried to show you all of those uh, treaty protocols that we have that there's a mechanism there to resolve that and that mechanism sustained our people up until about 1830, then the government changed its point of view and said, we're not long, no, no longer going to look at indigenous people as nations, but we're going to look at them as subjects. And we've been trying to get out from underneath that uh, ever since uh, that time. But one thing I have to give credit to my uh, ancestors and to the traditional people, they uh, have a tenacity. They fervently believe in our nationhood and our confederation still exists. Our chiefs and our clan mothers still uh, do their thing. It's certainly it's not perfect, but no no government is, and it it works as much as the people are willing to get involved in and make it work. Because our, in our former government, we operate by consensus and not by majority. Uh, we don't have a police to enforce our laws. We don't have a a, a judge and jury to determine the validity of our laws. It's uh, our sovereignty is held when our people believe it to be true and then act accordingly. So as Orrin uh, Lyon said at one time, he says, sovereignty is the act thereof. You're as sovereign as you can demonstrate. It's not granted to you. It can't be taken away, but you can relinquish it. So he said, be careful about what you do and what you agree to, because you can undermine the very foundation of your independence. Wow. Thank you so much, Rick. I think that's all of our questions for now. Was there anything else you wanted to say before I, I uh, wrap up the presentation? Well, let me just say this too, uh, you know, with the, the events coming up tomorrow, uh, I'm working right now on uh, helping to develop the exhibition plan for the 
for the Mohawk Institute, the oldest uh, residential school uh, in uh, Canada. Uh, it's going to be in uh, Brantford, and it's been a difficult journey for me. Uh, and uh, those two chiefs that I pointed out that were my relatives, they went to the Mohawk Institute, and uh, it, it still affects our lives today. So I think truth and reconciliation. Now we have a lot of a lot of truth, but there's a whole other truth about this the, the sovereignty of our nation that needs to be discussed needs to be talked about and that's why i wanted to make a shift from, from the residential schools to to this matter because uh i believe our nations will continue to exist i believe we, we have no reason to believe otherwise but whether our allies canada the united states great britain <clears throat> the netherlands uh, france or whether our our allies are willing to embrace that same idea but let me say this it's a very complicated matter because imagine if you're able to work this out. Let's just, let's just imagine that for some reason, the, the United States says, oh yes, we're gonna recognize the Haudenosaunee as an independent nation. There's a whole lot of other indigenous people, especially around the West Bank, around Africa, India, that would also want that kind of recognition. So it's, a, it's an international touchy matter, but we feel that because of La Crosse, it gives us, at least it gets us into that discussion. And so La Crosse is gifting back to us an opportunity to demonstrate our nationhood. And I think, uh, you know, uh, how we handle it is important, but I think it's a great opportunity. So I kind of, I, th I think the next 10 years will tell us a lot about <clears throat> how Canada is finally reconciling its opinion, uh, its rules, its laws, to be more compatible with recognizing indigenous sovereignty. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick, for taking the time to speak to our museum community today and for such an engaging presentation surrounding treaties and indigenous nationhood um, and both the history and future of La Crosse as a symbol of that nationhood and its validity. Thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge with us and for answering all of our questions. Well, our I, appreciate, I appreciate being invited to, to do this and uh, encourage everybody now, uh, tomorrow especially, go share this conversation with your relatives and your friends, uh, carry it forward and let's just see where it goes. Yes, for sure, excellent. Thank you to all of our participants who joined us today in recognition of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is, of course, September 30th, which is tomorrow. Um, please keep an eye out for other programming and events that the museum is running. You can find us on social media and, of course, subscribe to our newsletter if you want some more information about that. Um, and on that note, I wish you all a good afternoon and hope to see you all in person at the museum in the near future. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Rick. Hola.